good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, now that we've been introduced and uh, the floor uh, is, is uh, open now for me, I'd just like to s jump right into the uh, program uh, by s framing one important question. Uh, the title of the book has four uh, na the, uh, uh, words, main words, key words. It starts with land, then goes on to guns, caste, and women. So obviously, I will be framing a lot of the questions on the theme of the book itself. So my first question, Gita, is in the present day socio-economic context, uh, when agricultural policies seem to be making it hard to make a decent living from farming, do you still believe that land titles are the main source of economic stability for the landless Dalit community? Yes, it does seem ironical to say so when farming is in a crisis, but uh, we are actually a, a laddered society. We are a very, not just a hierarchical society socially, we are a very hierarchical society economically. So when you're looking at farmers um, uh, protesting in Delhi, um, you know, living in their tractors, but with electricity, power, toilets, and when you visit there, you get a, you know, good four-course meal. We don't think of the landless laborers who sort of skimp and save and work, you know, all through the uh, month, all through the summer months in, in, uh, in the sun, in the rain. And what they earn is not what even the minimum wages of in the Indian government uh, stipulates. And uh, they have no savings to fall back on. They have no land to sell if there's a crisis. They have no way to educate their children. One of, if now because there are, their children are going to school, but when they complete schooling and want to take up further studies and everything is now paid. And I know of very bright children from landless laborer, Dalit families who get admission into medicine or engineering or physiotherapy and are unable to pay the fees, you know, the first term fees of 60,000 because there isn't that kind of money. Whereas farmers, um, land is a big asset. So as long as land is in the control of, and, uh, uh, how graded farmers are is a different question. But it is uh, true that most of the land is in the control of a small percentage of people. So as, la as long as land is not socially available to those who work on it, those who are landless will always be at a disadvantage. And those who are landless have no social capital, very poor educational background, and when they come to cities, they only work as, you know, your security guards or the cleaners or the scavengers or the septic uh, latrine cleaners, etc. So how do you expect these people to acquire, to, I mean, a, a whole generation of them? Some of them, the specially talented or those with opportunities, those whom Christian missionaries or somebody else uh, promotes can get into, you know, you have these success stories. But the large mass of people, if they want to be, have to be lifted out of poverty and get some opportunities of education and employment, the only way out for them is land. Thank you. That was a very uh, interesting and um, very uh, wide-ranging uh, answer. So uh, further to that, would you say that your work with the struggle of Dalits for land is replicable in other parts of India? I think nothing is replicable. Everything is different. Yeah, uh, people are different, situations are different. So nothing is replicable. One, one thing is replicable. The wish to change the world and the will to take it up is absolutely replicable. It's been coming to us for centuries. So that's the one replicable thing. But how you do it is, depends on who you are, where you are placed, what's your support network, who are the people you work with. And who are the people you are up against? Yes, who are the people you are up against? But you have to be smarter than, than them always if you have to make some headway. Absolutely. So further, uh, how did women play a role in the struggles? And were they direct beneficiaries of the land allocations to the family? You did a, a many land, a lot of land was transferred to the uh, landless. So how did women not only struggle, participate in the struggle, what was their role? And whether the direct beneficiaries, in other words, did they get the title? Yes, in, uh, by the time uh, we were getting actually land in the name of people, the 90s, there was this, uh, uh, governments were promoting land for, in the name of women. 
So the titles did come in the name of women. That's, that was not an issue. How women came into the struggle, I think, um, one is also because I am associated, they see, uh, uh, they see a woman as part of, uh, as being a leader, as being part of the struggle. So that encourages other women to participate. Exactly. I think the second uh, reason is that there was a lot of repression, police uh, arrests, beatings, there were beatings by landlords. And usually I find that whenever there are situations where there's conflict uh, situations, the, the, village, the village or the community tends to put women in the front, front line because women don't get beaten so easily. It would be tough to justify police force beating up women. So women are pushed into, encouraged to be in the front line. And once they come forward as leaders and as active participants, you can't say, now go and sit back home, your job is over. Then they refuse to go back home. So that's how women stayed on to, you know, participate and lead in the struggle. So would you say, therefore, that their being in the forefront helped to keep this struggle nonviolent? So also, uh, do you believe in nonviolence as a principle for social movements? given your involvement in a radical left movement? No, no, I, I'm not sure that women are less violent than men are. I'm not at all sure about that. I mean, it, about 40 years back, they said, you know, women want peace, etc. But uh, I've always seen that uh, I was more violent than the men in my group. Yeah, because <laughs> we, are, we are converts. Women have just discovered, my God, the world is so bad. We got a chance to change it. Let's change it and let's change it right now, today. And if you have to beat up somebody, let's beat up somebody. <laughs> and the men, you know, a little bit, who is that fellow? How do we face him? Let's sort of think twice. Men are always willing to, women are willing to jump. And all our women carried chili powder with them all the time. Because any time if there was, uh, police were going to, you know, break up the dharna or push them, they'd, with, and nobody knew when the women would come forward with what stone, stones, chili powder and all. So I don't know about women being less violent. Uh, yeah, less violent. Okay. Um, so uh, further to that, do you from hind hindsight uh, regret your participation in the left movement? Do you see any future for left politics in India where there seems to be a very strong rightward shift and an emptying out or rather a hollowing out of the left and progressive political space. Now, some part of this question is like, what is your opinion of something? And um, I think opinions are only worth that much. They are not based on facts, and it's only an opinion of a person. So the second part of the question is, what is the future of the left movement is something I'd rather not answer because it's speculative and it's opinionated. But do I regret my participation in the left movement? Never. I mean, I, I think that was... Uh, you know, turning point in my life, I learned so many things, I may have lost some things and uh, there must have been a little bit of suffering, but I learned so much that um, I would never regret it. And I also didn't do anything sinful, you know. Suppose you've mm, beaten up someone or killed someone, that, that would haunt you for the rest of your life. But I didn't do anything which can be construed as sinful or criminal. I mean. We organized and we marched in dharnas, protests, and uh, peaceful things. Of course, we went underground, but then so many people went underground during emergency. And even when we went underground, you didn't, we didn't pick up arms or do anything. So uh, there is no regret on that front. But whether the left, ha um, I left, I, I um, you know, quit the left because I saw no future in it. That uh, was way back in 76, uh, late, uh, 76, November 76. So uh, to an extent it answers your question is that I don't see future in it for myself and for a, for a large section of young people. I don't see a uh, future in the left. Okay. But whether the left is, you know, ex going to be extinct, that's, I, mean, I wouldn't speculate because the left can also change itself, may also change itself. Uh, so, uh, may I, in that case, yeah, you can say, could you say a little more about what made you uh, feel that there is, you don't see any future? Did you, uh, was it uh, the uh, understanding about caste uh, and their approach to caste or their lack of uh, mainstreaming that? Uh, uh, what was your, uh, the reason for you to get disaffected with the left movement? I wasn't clued on to caste when I 
quit the left movement. I wasn't, caste came as a, you know, big thing in my life only after the Karam Chedu uh, massacre in 1985. Till then I wasn't clued onto caste, it was something out there which, you know, we were not concerned because we thought we were casteless. We thought we didn't bother which caste we belonged to and it didn't impact us as to, you know, caste did impact us and we were all casteist in several ways which I can't tell you right now. But uh, what uh, disillusioned me about the left was the dishonesty. Now, uh, any movement for change has uh, some idealism in it. We wanted to change the world. I mean, my batch of people, we thought that we wanted to have poverty eradicated. We wanted to see that the children from the bastis and the villages come to school and have a decent chance at education. We wanted to see that people had enough money in their hands to eat you know, a decent meal and have a shelter over their heads. So to change the world. And then the left movement, um, what, I, I don't know at what point the change come, but the survival of the party is more important than the cause for which the party is found. So when that is there, there's a break with idealism. I mean, why we bother about the party? You know, let the party go hang, but what we joined the party for, that was important for us. And then there were several small things which I've recounted in my book about uh, one of the senior leaders of the party, his, uh, he lost his shelter, so he and his wife came to stay with us, uh, with my partner and my. And when someone stays with you, you know, then uh, you know everything about them. It's different. I mean, you may see me in an audience and think, oh my, she's such a good woman. But if you stay with me, you'll know how flawed I am. So we stayed with them for a month and a half and, uh, you know, they cook chicken, we ate only beef. Uh, they would buy clothes, we never, I mean, clothes were never bought, somebody gifted, they, somebody gifted you clothes or you wore what you had. And uh, um, it was on with these very small things. And the wife served her husband, which was like so insulting to me, you know, because I married on the condition that 50-50. You know, you do 50%, I do 50% of the housework, not 1% more or less. And here she was, you know, putting his bath water out, scrubbing his back, and laying out his food, and keeping the uh, pita there, and then he'll wash his hands in the plate, and then she'll take the thing. I watched, I thought, I was, oh, this thing, what is this going on? And then uh, there was a lot of discussion over it. Actually, on hindsight, um, there was some sense in... Uh, uh, I mean, see, people, they came from a feudal background. So that's how they were, right? And I was not from that background. So probably I should have understood that that's a different generation which is not going to change so fast. But at, at that moment, it seemed to me so insulting that you want to have a party which wants to change the world, but which in daily relations is like so hypocritical and got such double standards. It seemed to me very insulting. And then finally, you know, when after the discussion became so heated, he threw a book. You know, I was sitting there and he was sitting there, he threw a book at me and said, you and I can read it, they can't read it. That is, they is the people, you know, so we are different, we are leaders. And I thought that was like, you know, the pits, I mean, if you, I did, we, we um, I mean, we entered the movement because we wanted to identify ourselves with people. It's not as if we saw ourselves as leaders or as something. We thought everybody needs an opportunity and everybody is equally entitled. And here's someone saying, you know, they are different and I'm different. And then how is this different from my father who said, you know, you're a woman, so this is where you need to stay. And men are what they are. So I thought, what's the difference between my father and this man? And that was how uh, a very small thing in daily relations led to. And of course, there was a discussion about uh, the kind of work. Then it led to a whole opening of it. See, once you want to question someone, like when I questioned my own family, you question over a small thing and then the thread unravels and then you question them about everything. You start seeing the world in a different way because you're willing to question. So then the questioning began on why do we use people as cannon fodder for police? Why don't we treat people's legitimate grievances and, you know, mobilize on that? Why do we tell them about some Cambodia or some Iraq or Syria or something and not bother about the daily issues over here? So then we took, and then why do you take up arms if you can't fight the police? Why do you take up arms at all? If you're getting shot down and you have to run away, why did you take it up? What was the sense in taking it up? So on all these questions, there were, you know, these 
this communists have this habit documents you know i send you a document you write another document and so there were these exchange of documents for few months and then they kicked us out said these people are whatever this and that's it um, we were expelled or we resigned and that's how we quit uh, in terms of uh, agency for women uh, taking that uh, this kind of thread forward do you think it's easier for girl, uh, for girls these days compare your own personal experience with what you see as present day uh, experiences of girls to exercise their own agency in choice of career marriage or life goals and uh, how do you recall your struggle to make these choices yeah certainly it's easier no today's uh, girls stand on our shoulders the the battles we fought are benefiting you today yeah because um, i wanted to study in the iit and my father said no i can't pay for a hostel and what will a girl do studying in the iit you do some bama and then you become a teacher because that's what women that's do true. you know you can run a household you can look after your husband and children and you can teach that's enough for you so um, i mean one didn't have a choice and um, no but uh, i always think it's easier it was easier for women then and it's easier for women now to fight because of our vulnerability we have a certain privilege in the eyes of society if a woman does something people support because they say i mean if you do something against the grain you know like if you leave home or you rebel they say why did she do it they don't say that's a bad woman who did this people think because we are vulnerable they they uh, understanding that vulnerability they give us a special leeway which they don't give men so i think we have we uh, we had an advantage then because even though i had to leave home i found other supporters there were so many other people who supported me and said she wants to do the way wants to live the way she wants to she should be helped and even now i am sure for girls there are lot of support so we have our vulnerabilities but we have our privileges i think it cuts both ways i don't think we are a disadvantaged sex in that way you know uh so in that in that context how did the you know the uh, women's movements you were with a specific land struggle movement uh and uh, had a particular cause uh, be, uh, you know behind which you were uh, f- following and you were working on that but what is the larger women's movements and struggles what role or what support did they have or were there friendships or relationships among the in that uh which had its role to play in your own work oh, when you're asking me one specific incident which i relate in the book and in which uh, i have a mm, very Experience. deep rupture with the feminist feminist some of the feminist in hyderabad i have been part of the feminist movement and many of them are very close to me we are good friends um and we continue to be big friends but there is this unexplained rupture because at that time i think um, in the 80s um i think as with any new movement the feminists were on a high you know like we are the ones who are going to change the world we are going to tell the men where to get off we are going to tell the left where to get off we know everything there is so there was a certain amount of arrogance hubris absolutely and then um, um, i really don't talk about my work much you know many of my friends don't know about the work because i think what you need to do only you need to know you don't need to go you know uh, carry a mic and talk about it to everybody so many people didn't know about my work or the depth of my work in the villages so uh, it was considered some kind of left activity you know which was feminists didn't consider that working with people was anything feminist was scholarship breaking new ground in theory and uh, so so they were doing very important work and i was in very unimportant work so at that time i think the rupture was caused because they discounted me uh and your work and my work and then and i wrote about it 30 years later yeah so it's i don't know whether it's coming full circle but nobody has spoken about it this is like this elephant in the room i mean we are speaking about it in public i'm on the mic speaking to you and while i speak to them every second day no one mentions it so it's a very peculiar thing that i can discuss this publicly but not privately with them so that's how it is so in other words you think it's an a- antithesis of the uh, feminist dictum that personal is political 
I really don't know because I, I can't read into their minds. I don't know why. I ask them, why won't you discuss? I mean, a number of times I've asked them, discuss it. I want to know you hurt me so deeply. Why did you do it? How did you do it? They say, no, we don't want to discuss it. So I really don't know. Uh, I would say uh, that one of the other important things and what you're better known for also in recent years is you have had a long involvement in publishing and promoting books uh, which are uh, which in, in, in Indian languages, writers, uh, little known writers publishing their work and also promoting, marketing their work. So um, how do you think publishing, because it, this has to do with today's event, um, uh, do you think publishing, especially in Indian languages, print, uh, uh, does it have a great future? What do you, what do you, how do you, what's your experience in uh, HPT? Um, this morning I attended uh, Vasudendra's talk over here and he said, uh, it's only after his book came out in English, Tejo Tungabhadra, that, you know, he became famous and everybody talked about it. And he said, while the book was equally good or better in Kannada, Nobody knew him as much as they know him now. Then I told him when he, he was called onto the stage, there was a standing ovation from the crowd, which wasn't there for Pico Ayer or for Na Nilekani, the, um, what's her name? Um, Rohini. Nilekani. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't a standing ovation. There was a standing ovation for uh, Vasudendra. So there's a flip side of it is that the Indian language, Indian language publishing is very, closely tied to people. Exactly. Uh, and English language publishing is in, you know, five-star places like this where, um, you know, he, um, he, he said another thing. This is another writer. This was Jay Mohan. Um, no, this was, um, I forget, and I'm getting to an age where I forget who's who. But they said that when went even a Europe tour, he would get a meal and a place to stay anywhere uh, in Europe because his fans, people who read him were there. While the same English author, you know, you might be Pico Ayer or you might be some famous person, but if you go somewhere, you stay in this cold five-star hotel where you see the four walls of a house in the evening. So, but you get to an places like this where you analogy. get, you know, uh, uh, 20 lakhs advance. The English language is fancy, no? You, the literary festivals are places like this. Uh, and people like us occasionally get invited yeah, but uh, the warmth that right. you get, the warmth that you get in the Indian language publishing is something else because you are with people at the grassroots. You are people who are closer. Okay, they may be uh, savarna, they may be landlord, but they are people closer to the roots than the other crowd. You are speaking their language. You are speaking their language and writing and about their chance, lives. There is a chance that you can pick up other things more easily than. Say English language publishing will pick up one Perumal Murugan and then everybody will translate Perumal Murugan as if there's no other Tamil writer worth his name. Or if Vasudendra is now the flavor of the decade, then all his books will be translated. And I'm sure there are so many other Kannada writers. Whereas those of us who are rooted in our own native cultures, we know that there's so many people out there who need to be brought to the forefront. Yes, correct. Thank you so much. That is a beautiful answer. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Uh, now to a little bit to the personal. Uh, in the, towards, uh, towards the end of the book, your book al almost closes with the birth of your uh, daughter. And also you, you, you say that, if from hindsight you say, I was flawed in my understanding of my role and what happened because I was no longer there, the people, how, what happened to them. Would you like to say, I mean, so the question really is about what is your experience of motherhood and your opinion in this, in this context of women in full-time social activism, because I happen to be one also. So what has been your experience? Oh, that's, that's what my second book is about. If the first book is celebratory, the second book is about how I went to pieces on becoming a mother. Yeah, all my mental illnesses, all the depression and the anguish, episodes of anxiety and all that which comes on being, because being a mother, they may give you a whole load of shit about how fulfilling it is or, you know, uh, you bond with your daughter. But uh, you are carrying the burden largely alone. 
and society is sort of relegated to your corner. You bring up your child, and then when the child is decent enough not to shit or pee or vomit or yell in polite society, then you can come back to us. So there's a whole load of shit there which is not talked about, which is what my uh, second book is about. Yeah, And that's a very difficult uh, terrain because one is alone. You know, you made the choice of being a mother. Nobody asked you to become a mother, really. And then uh, everybody says, so many women have had children. Millions of women have had children. So what's so special about you? You know? So you, everybody suffered, you also suffer. That's the kind of thing you get back from society. So that's, uh, uh, it's not joyous in that way. This book was joyous. This book gave me great joy to write and think about. This second book, which I'm, which, you know, is my first draft is not joyous, but it will discourage lots of women from having children. <laughs> Maybe we'll take one or two questions, just one or two questions, because we want also to interact. Any one lucky or two lucky people who get to answer. Yeah. Yes. I just started reading your book, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, my question is, uh, did you have, since you've been so much like a people person and uh, located in the movement, did you discuss with the people you're writing about that you are writing a book? And what was their reaction? No, it was actually, uh, the funny part is, the people who run my, who run the Hyderabad Book Trust, that's the Telugu publishing I work in, are the sons and grandsons of the people I worked in in Ibrahim Patnam. It's those people who continue. Say, they've been after me for so long saying, we don't know, we just heard one story from our grandfather or father, write about it, write about it, you're writing about other things, why don't you write about our struggle? So in that sense, they were the, the people who pushed me to it. But when I actually did my first draft, I didn't consult anybody. My first draft was a kind of catharsis. My husband had passed away after a long illness, very difficult time for me. And uh, uh, the psychiatrist had gone to said, you know, what will help at this time is remember some joyful moments of your life and that will keep you going. So I sat down and wrote this over a one and a half month period. And much later, when I thought of that this could become a book, that's when I went back to them to check, cross-verify. And oh, they're raising money for the Telugu publication. They're thinking that uh, you need a lot of money. And so they're raising money for the Telugu book because English book is not something they can read. Yes, so they are in the process too. Okay, thank you so much.